Evidence-Based Medicine, Wikipedia Audio Evidence-Based Medicine is an approach to medical practice intended to optimize decision-making by emphasizing the use of evidence from well-designed and well-conducted research. Although all medicine based on science has some degree of empirical support, EBM goes further, classifying evidence by its epistemologic strength and requiring that only the strongest types can yield strong recommendations, weaker types can yield only weak recommendations. The term was originally used to describe an approach to teaching the practice of medicine and improving decisions by individual physicians about individual patients. Use of the term rapidly expanded to include a previously described approach that emphasized the use of evidence in the design of guidelines and policies that apply to groups of patients and populations. It has subsequently spread to describe an approach to decision-making that is used at virtually every level of healthcare as well as other fields. Whether applied to medical education, decisions about individuals, guidelines, and policies applied to populations, or administration of health services in general, evidence-based medicine advocates that to the greatest extent possible. Decisions and policies should be based on evidence, not just the beliefs of practitioners, experts, or administrators. It thus tries to assure that a clinician's opinion, which may be limited by knowledge gaps or biases, is supplemented with all available knowledge from the scientific literature so that best practice can be determined and applied. It promotes the use of formal, explicit methods to analyze evidence and makes it available to decision makers. It promotes programs to teach the methods to medical students, practitioners, and policy makers. In its broadest form, evidence-based medicine is the application of the scientific method into healthcare decision making. Medicine has a long tradition of both basic and clinical research that dates back at least to Avicenna and more recently to Protestant Reformation exegesis of the 17th and 18th centuries. An early critique of statistical methods in medicine was published in 1835. Background, History and Definition However, until recently, the process by which research results were incorporated in medical decisions was highly subjective. Called clinical judgment and the art of medicine, the traditional approach to making decisions about individual patients depended on having each individual physician determine what research evidence, if any, to consider, and how to merge that evidence with personal beliefs and other factors. In the case of decisions which applied to groups of patients or populations, the guidelines and policies would usually be developed by committees of experts, but there was no formal process for determining the extent to which research evidence should be considered or how it should be merged with the beliefs of the committee members. There was an implicit assumption that decision makers and policy makers would incorporate evidence in their thinking appropriately based on their education, experience, and ongoing study of the applicable literature. Beginning in the late 1960s, several flaws became apparent in the traditional approach to medical decision-making. Alvin Feinstein's publication of Clinical Judgment in 1967 focused attention on the role of clinical reasoning and identified biases that can affect it. In 1972, Archie Cochran published Effectiveness and Efficiency, which described the lack of controlled trials supporting many practices that had previously been assumed to be effective. In 1973, John Wenberg began to document wide variations in how physicians practiced. Through the 1980s, David M. Eddy described errors in clinical reasoning and gaps in evidence. In the mid-1980s, Alvin Feinstein, David Sackett, and others published textbooks on clinical epidemiology, which translated epidemiological methods to physician decision-making. 
Toward the end of the 1980s, a group at Rand showed that large proportions of procedures performed by physicians were considered inappropriate even by the standards of their own experts. These areas of research increased awareness of the weaknesses in medical decision-making at the level of both individual patients and populations, and paved the way for the introduction of evidence-based methods. Level I Evidence obtained from at least one properly designed randomized controlled trial. Level 2 1. Evidence obtained from well designed controlled trials without randomization. Level 2 2. Evidence obtained from well designed cohort studies or case control studies, preferably from more than one center or research group. Level 2 3. Evidence obtained from multiple time series designs with or without the intervention. Dramatic results in uncontrolled trials might also be regarded as this type of evidence. Level 3. Opinions of respected authorities, based on clinical experience, descriptive studies, or reports of expert committees. The term evidence-based medicine, as it is currently used, has two main tributaries. Chronologically, the first is the insistence on explicit evaluation of evidence of effectiveness when issuing clinical practice guidelines and other population-level policies. The second is the introduction of epidemiological methods into medical education and individual patient-level decision-making. The term evidence-based was first used by David M. Eddy in the course of his work on population-level policies such as clinical practice guidelines and insurance coverage of new technologies. He first began to use the term evidence-based in 1987 in workshops and a manual commissioned by the Council of Medical Specialty Societies to teach formal methods for designing clinical practice guidelines. The manual was widely available in unpublished form in the late 1980s and eventually published by the American College of Medicine. Eddy first published the term evidence-based in March, 1990 in an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association that laid out the principles of evidence-based guidelines and population-level policies which Eddy described as explicitly describing the available evidence that pertains to a policy and tying the policy to evidence. Consciously anchoring a policy, not to current practices or the beliefs of experts, but to experimental evidence. The policy must be consistent with and supported by evidence. The pertinent evidence must be identified, described, and analyzed. The policymakers must determine whether the policy is justified by the evidence. A rationale must be written. He discussed evidence-based policies in several other papers published in JAMA in the spring of 1990. Those papers were part of a series of 28 published in JAMA between 1990 and 1997 on formal methods for designing population-level guidelines and policies. The term evidence-based medicine was introduced slightly later, in the context of medical education. This branch of evidence-based medicine has its roots in clinical epidemiology. In the autumn of 1990, Gordon Guyot used it in an unpublished description of a program at McMaster University for prospective or new medical students. Guyot and others first published the term two years later to describe a new approach to teaching the practice of medicine. In 1996, David Sackett and colleagues clarified the definition of this tributary of evidence-based medicine as the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. This branch of evidence-based medicine aims to make individual decision-making more structured and objective by better reflecting the evidence from research. Population-based data are applied to the care of an individual patient, 
while respecting the fact that practitioners have clinical expertise reflected in effective and efficient diagnosis and thoughtful identification and compassionate use of individual patients' predicaments, rights, and preferences. This tributary of evidence-based medicine had its foundations in clinical epidemiology, a discipline that teaches healthcare workers how to apply clinical and epidemiological research studies to their practices. Between 1993 and 2000, the Evidence-Based Medicine Working Group at McMaster University published the methods to a broad physician audience in a series of 25 users' guides to the medical literature in JAMA. In 1995 Rosenberg and Donald defined individual-level evidence-based medicine as the process of finding, appraising, and using contemporaneous research findings as the basis for medical decisions. In 2010, Greenhalgh used a definition that emphasized quantitative methods, the use of mathematical estimates of the risk of benefit and harm derived from high-quality research on population samples, to inform clinical decision-making in the diagnosis, investigation, or management of individual patients. Many other definitions have been offered for individual-level evidence-based medicine, but the one by Sackett and colleagues is the most commonly cited. Risk of Bias is a judgment made on the basis of the chance that bias in included studies has influenced the estimate of effect, imprecision, is a judgment made on the basis of the chance that the observed estimate of effect could change completely, indirectness, is a judgment made on the basis of the differences in characteristics of how the study was conducted and how the results are actually going to be applied, inconsistency, is a judgment made on the basis of the variability of results. Across the included studies, publication bias, is a judgment made on the basis of the question whether all the research evidence has been taken to account. The two original definitions highlight important differences in how evidence-based medicine is applied to populations versus individuals. When designing guidelines applied to large groups of people in settings where there is relatively little opportunity for modification by individual physicians, evidence-based policymaking stresses that there should be good evidence to document a test S or treatment S effectiveness. In the setting of individual decision-making, practitioners can be given greater latitude in how they interpret research and combine it with their clinical judgment. In 2005 Eddy offered an umbrella definition for the two branches of EBM, evidence-based medicine is a set of principles and methods intended to ensure that to the greatest extent possible, medical decisions, guidelines, and other types of policies are based on and consistent with good evidence of effectiveness and benefit. Both branches of evidence-based medicine spread rapidly. On the evidence-based guidelines and policies side, explicit insistence on evidence of effectiveness was introduced by the American Cancer Society in 1980. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force began issuing guidelines for preventive interventions based on evidence-based principles in 1984. In 1985, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association applied strict evidence-based criteria for covering new technologies. Beginning in 1987, specialty societies such as the American College of Physicians, and voluntary health organizations such as the American Heart Association, wrote many evidence-based guidelines. In 1991, Kaiser Permanente, a managed care organization in the U.S., began an evidence-based guidelines program. In 1991, Richard Smith wrote an editorial in the British Medical Journal and introduced the ideas of evidence-based policies in the U.K. In 1993, the Cochrane Collaboration created a network of 13 countries to produce of systematic reviews and guidelines. In 1997, 
the U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality established evidence-based practice centers to produce evidence reports and technology assessments to support the development of guidelines. In the same year, a national guideline clearinghouse that followed the principles of evidence-based policies was created by AHRQ, the AMA, and the American Association of Health Plans. In 1999, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence was created in the UK. A central idea of this branch of evidence-based medicine is that evidence should be classified according to the rigor of its experimental design, and the strength of a recommendation should depend on the strength of the evidence. Large effect, this is when methodologically strong studies show that the observed effect is so large that the probability of it changing completely is less likely, plausible confounding would change the effect, this is when despite the presence of a possible confounding factor which is expected to reduce the observed effect, the effect estimate still shows significant effect, dose response gradient, this is when the intervention used becomes more effective with increasing dose. This suggests that a further increase will likely bring about more effect. Clinical Decision Making On the medical education side, programs to teach evidence-based medicine have been created in medical schools in Canada, the US, the UK, Australia, and other countries. A 2009 study of UK programs found that more than half of UK medical schools offered some training in evidence-based medicine, although there was considerable variation in the methods and content, and EBM teaching was restricted by lack of curriculum time, trained tutors and teaching materials. Many programs have been developed to help individual physicians gain better access to evidence. For example, UpToDate was created in the early 1990s. The Cochrane Collaboration began publishing evidence reviews in 1993. BMJ Publishing Group launched a six-monthly periodical in 1995 called Clinical Evidence that provided brief summaries of the current state of evidence about important clinical questions for clinicians. Since then many other programs have been developed to make evidence more accessible to practitioners. The term evidence-based medicine is now applied to both the programs that are designing evidence-based guidelines and the programs that teach evidence-based medicine to practitioners. By 2000, evidence-based medicine had become an umbrella term for the emphasis on evidence in both population-level and individual-level decisions. In subsequent years, Use of the term evidence-based had extended to other levels of the healthcare system. An example is evidence-based health services, which seek to increase the competence of health service decision-makers and the practice of evidence-based medicine at the organizational or institutional level. The concept has also spread outside of healthcare, for example, in his 1996 inaugural speech as president of the Royal Statistical Society, Adrian Smith proposed that evidence-based policy should be established for education, prisons, and policing policy in all areas of government work. The multiple tributaries of evidence-based medicine share an emphasis on the importance of incorporating evidence from formal research in medical policies and decisions. However they differ on the extent to which they require good evidence of effectiveness before promulgating a guideline or payment policy, and they differ on the extent to which it is feasible to incorporate individual level information in decisions. Thus, evidence-based guidelines and policies may not readily hybridize with experience-based practices orientated towards ethical clinical judgment and can lead to contradictions, contest, and unintended crises. The most effective knowledge leaders use a broad range of management knowledge in their decision-making, rather than just formal evidence.
Evidence-based guidelines may provide the basis for governmentality in healthcare and consequently play a central role in the distant governance of contemporary healthcare systems. The steps for designing explicit, evidence-based guidelines were described in the late 1980s, formulate the question, search the literature to identify studies that inform the question, interpret each study to determine precisely what it says about the question, if several studies address the question, synthesize their results, summarize the evidence in evidence tables, compare the benefits, harms and costs in a balance sheet, draw a conclusion about the preferred practice, write the guideline, write the rationale for the guideline, have others review each of the previous steps, implement the guideline. For the purposes of medical education and individual level decision making, five steps of EBM in practice were described in 1992 and the experience of delegates attending the 2003 Conference of Evidence-Based Healthcare Teachers and Developers was summarized into five steps and published in 2005. This five-step process can broadly be categorized as Systematic reviews of published research studies is a major part of the evaluation of particular treatments. The Cochrane Collaboration is one of the best-known programs that conducts systematic reviews. Like other collections of systematic reviews, it requires authors to provide a detailed and repeatable plan of their literature search and evaluations of the evidence. Once all the best evidence is assessed, treatment is categorized as likely to be beneficial, likely to be harmful, or evidence did not support either benefit or harm. A 2007 analysis of 1,016 systematic reviews from all 50 Cochrane Collaboration Review Groups found that 44% of the reviews concluded that the intervention was likely to be beneficial, 7% concluded that the intervention was likely to be harmful, and 49% concluded that evidence did not support either benefit or harm. 96% recommended further research. A 2001 review of 160 Cochrane systematic reviews in the 1998 database revealed that, according to two readers, 41% concluded positive or possibly positive effect, 20% concluded evidence of no effect, 8% concluded net harmful effects, and 21% of the reviews concluded insufficient evidence. A review of 145 alternative medicine Cochrane reviews using the 2004 database revealed that 38.4% concluded positive effect or possibly positive effect, 4.8% concluded no effect, 0.7% concluded harmful effect, and 56.6% concluded insufficient evidence. In 2017, a study assessed the role of systematic reviews produced by Cochrane Collaboration to inform U.S. private payers' policies making. It showed that though medical policy documents of major U.S. private were informed by Cochrane's systematic review, there was still scope to encourage the further usage. Evidence-based Evidence-based guidelines and policies Evidence quality can be assessed based on the source type, as well as other factors including statistical validity, clinical relevance, currency, and peer review acceptance. Evidence-based medicine categorizes different types of clinical evidence and rates or grades them according to the strength of their freedom from the various biases that beset medical research. For example, the strongest evidence for therapeutic interventions is provided by systematic review of randomized, triple-blind, placebo-controlled trials with allocation concealment and complete follow-up involving a homogeneous patient population and medical condition. In contrast, patient testimonials, case reports, and even expert opinion. 
have little value as proof because of the placebo effect, the biases inherent in observation and reporting of cases, difficulties in ascertaining who is an expert and more. High Quality Evidence The authors are very confident that the estimate that is presented lies very close to the true value. One could interpret it as there is very low probability of further research completely changing the presented conclusions, moderate. Quality evidence, the authors are confident that the presented estimate lies close to the true value, but it is also possible that it may be substantially different. One could also interpret it as, further research may completely change the conclusions, low quality evidence. The authors are not confident in the effect estimate and the true value may be substantially different. One could interpret it as further research is likely to change the presented conclusions completely, very. Low quality evidence, the authors do not have any confidence in the estimate and it is likely that the true value is substantially different from it. One could interpret it as new research will most probably change the presented conclusions completely. Medical Education Progress Current Practice Methods Steps Several organizations have developed grading systems for assessing the quality of evidence. For example, in 1989 the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force put forth the following. Level A, good scientific evidence suggests that the benefits of the clinical service substantially outweigh the potential risks. Clinicians should discuss the service with eligible patients. Level B, at least fair scientific evidence suggests that the benefits of the clinical service outweighs the potential risks. Clinicians should discuss the service with eligible patients. Level C. At least fair scientific evidence suggests that there are benefits provided by the clinical service, but the balance between benefits and risks are too close for making general recommendations. Clinicians need not offer it unless there are individual considerations. Level D. At least fair scientific evidence suggests that the risks of the clinical service outweighs potential benefits. Clinicians should not routinely offer the service to asymptomatic patients. Level I, scientific evidence is lacking, of poor quality, or conflicting, such that the risk versus benefit balance cannot be assessed. Clinicians should help patients understand the uncertainty surrounding the clinical service. Another example is the Oxford CEBM Levels of Evidence. First released in September 2000, the Oxford CEBM Levels of Evidence provides levels of evidence for claims about prognosis, diagnosis, treatment benefits, treatment harms, and screening which most grading schemes do not address. The original CEBM levels was evidence based on call to make the process of finding evidence feasible and its results explicit. In 2011, an international team redesigned the Oxford CEBM levels to make it more understandable and to take into account recent developments in evidence ranking schemes. The Oxford CEBM levels of evidence have been used by patients, clinicians, and also to develop clinical guidelines including recommendations for the optimal use of phototherapy and topical therapy in psoriasis and guidelines for the use of the BCLC staging system for diagnosing and monitoring hepatocellular carcinoma in Canada. Likelihood Ratio, Main Article Likelihood ratios in diagnostic testing, the pre-test odds of a particular diagnosis, multiplied by the likelihood ratio, determines the post-test odds. Probability This reflects Bayes' theorem. The differences in likelihood ratio between clinical tests can be used to prioritize clinical tests according to their usefulness in a given clinical situation 
A UC rock the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve reflects the relationship between sensitivity and specificity for a given test. High quality tests will have an AUC rock approaching 1, and high quality publications about clinical tests will provide information about the AUC rock. Cut off values for positive and negative tests can influence specificity and sensitivity but they do not affect AUC rock, number needed to treat slash number needed to harm. Number needed to treat or number needed to harm are ways of expressing the effectiveness and safety, respectively, of interventions in a way that is clinically meaningful. NNT is the number of people who need to be treated in order to achieve the desired outcome in one patient. For example, if a treatment increases the chance of survival by 5%, then 20 people need to be treated in order to have one additional patient survive due to the treatment. The concept can also be applied to diagnostic tests. For example, if 1,339 women age 50-59 have to be invited for breast cancer screening over a 10-year period in order to prevent one woman from dying of breast cancer, then the NNT for being invited to breast cancer screening is 1,339. In 2000, a system was developed by the GRADE Working Group and takes into account more dimensions than just the quality of medical research. It requires users of GRADE who are performing an assessment of the quality of evidence, usually as part of a systematic review, to consider the impact of different factors on their confidence in the results. Authors of GRADE tables grade the quality of evidence into four levels on the basis of their confidence in the observed effect being close to what the true effect is. The confidence value is based on judgments assigned in five different domains in a structured manner. The grade working group defines quality of evidence and strength of recommendations based on the quality as two different concepts which are commonly confused with each other. Trial Design Considerations High-quality studies have clearly defined eligibility criteria and have minimal missing data, generalizability considerations. Studies may only be applicable to narrowly defined patient populations and may not be generalizable to other clinical contexts. Follow-up Sufficient time for defined outcomes to occur can influence the prospective study outcomes and the statistical power of a study to detect differences between a treatment and control arm, power. A mathematical calculation can determine if the number of patients is sufficient to detect a difference between treatment arms. A negative study may reflect a lack of benefit or simply a lack of sufficient quantities of patients to detect a difference. Evidence Reviews Systematic reviews may include randomized controlled trials that have low risk of bias, or, observational studies that have high risk of bias. In the case of randomized controlled trials, the quality of evidence is high, but can be downgraded in five different domains. In the case of observational studies per grade, the quality of evidence starts of lower and may be upgraded in three domains in addition to being subject to downgrading. Meaning of the levels of quality of evidence as per grade In guidelines and other publications, recommendation for a clinical service is classified by the balance of risk versus benefit and the level of evidence on which this information is based. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uses Grade guideline panelists may make strong or weak recommendations on the basis of further criteria. Some of the important criteria are the balance between desirable and undesirable effects, the quality of the evidence, values, and preferences and costs. Despite the differences between systems, the purposes are the same 
to guide users of clinical research information on which studies are likely to be most valid. However, the individual studies still require careful critical appraisal. Evidence-based medicine attempts to express clinical benefits of tests and treatments using mathematical methods. Tools used by practitioners of evidence-based medicine include Assessing the quality of evidence Evidence-based medicine attempts to objectively evaluate the quality of clinical research by critically assessing techniques reported by researchers in their publications. Although evidence-based medicine is regarded as the gold standard of clinical practice, there are a number of limitations and criticisms of its use. Two widely cited categorization schemes for the various published critiques of EBM include the three-fold division of Strauss and McAllister and the five-point categorization of Cohen, Stavry, and Hirsch. The theoretical ideal of EBM faces the limitation that research is expensive, thus, in reality, for the foreseeable future, there will always be much more demand for EBM than supply, and the best humanity can do is to triage the application of scarce resources, research produced by EBM, such as from randomized controlled trials, may not be relevant for all treatment situations. Research tends to focus on specific populations, but individual persons can vary substantially from population norms. Since certain population segments have been historically under-researched, evidence from RCTs may not be generalizable to those populations. Thus EBM applies to groups of people but this should not preclude clinicians from using their personal experience in deciding how to treat each patient. One author advises that the knowledge gained from clinical research does not directly answer the primary clinical question of what is best for the patient at hand and suggests that evidence-based medicine should not discount the value of clinical experience. Another author stated that the practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systematic research. Research can be influenced by biases such as publication bias and conflict of interest. For example, studies with conflicts due to industry funding are more likely to favor their product there is a lag between when the RCT is conducted and when its results are published, there is a lag between when results are published and when these are properly applied, hypocognition can hinder the application of EBM, values, while patient values are considered in the original definition of EBM, the importance of values is not commonly emphasized in EBM training, a potential problem under Current study Categories of recommendations In no particular order, some published objections include One of the ongoing challenges with evidence-based medicine is that some healthcare providers do not follow the evidence. This happens partly because the current balance of evidence for and against treatments shifts constantly, and it is impossible to learn about every change. Even when the evidence is unequivocally against a treatment, it usually takes 10 years for other treatments to be adopted. In other cases, significant change can require a generation of physicians to retire or die, and be replaced by physicians who were trained with more recent evidence. Statistical measures Quality of clinical trials Limitations and Criticism Another major cause of physicians and other healthcare providers treating patients in ways unsupported by the evidence is that these healthcare providers are subject to the same cognitive biases as all other humans. They may reject the evidence because they have a vivid memory of a rare but shocking outcome, such as a patient dying after refusing treatment. They may overtreat to do something or to address a patient's emotional needs. 
they may worry about malpractice charges based on a discrepancy between what the patient expects and what the evidence recommends. They may also overtreat or provide ineffective treatments because the treatment feels biologically plausible. The Berlin Questionnaire and the Fresno Test are validated instruments for assessing the effectiveness of education in evidence-based medicine. These questionnaires have been used in diverse settings. A Campbell systematic review that included 24 trials examined the effectiveness of e-learning in improving evidence-based healthcare knowledge and practice. It was found that e-learning, compared to no learning, improves evidence-based healthcare knowledge and skills but not attitudes and behavior. There is no difference in outcomes when comparing e-learning to face-to-face -face learning. Combining e-learning with face-to-face -face learning has a positive impact on evidence-based knowledge, skills, attitude, and behavior. Related to e-learning, medical school students have engaged with editing Wikipedia to increase their EBM skills. Application of Evidence in Clinical Settings Education Bibliography